James Luxon, delighted to be joined today on the podcast with Jackie Callan. Jackie, the, the first lady in boxing, um, you, we're talking today about James Tony. You worked with James for, I believe, six years, if I'm correct in saying. Now, talk to me first of all about when you first met James Tony. You know, it was one of those things. They say certain things are meant to be. And I believe that um, James and I were meant to come together. At the time, it was 1988. I was working with another young fighter named Bobby Hitz. He was a heavyweight out of Chicago. He had come to Detroit to fight George Foreman during George Foreman's comeback. And although he didn't win the fight, I thought what a nice young man he was. And maybe with the proper training and managing, he might have a chance at doing something. So he came to Detroit and started working out here at a local gym. And that's where we first saw James. He was sparring and he didn't like the way his sparring was that day. And he just threw a fit. He went and took the spit bucket and kicked it. He went in the locker room and punched the lockers. He was so upset. And I was so, I can't say impressed by his behavior, but I was impressed by his passion, by the fact that he was so hard on himself that when he didn't do well, he actually you know, reacted to it in a negative way. So we got to talking and the trainer that was with him explained that his manager had been killed maybe a month before that. So he had a few fights. He was a four round fighter. He was left with no manager. And after watching him a few days, I thought there's a lot of promise here. And I talked to his trainer and I said, I would really be interested in perhaps buying out the rest of the contract if there is one and there was and so that's what happened i bought out the remainder of his contract and uh we started working together you've said on record quite a few times that he was like a son to you you know that's a oh absolutely at the time when we started working together james is the same age approximately the same age as my two boys and they all became instant friends, you know, because they were all within a year or two of each other. And he lived at our house for a while. And so my kids were in college. James was like part of the family. We traveled. If we took a family trip, James came with us. And he truly was someone that he knew he could confide in me, that I cared about him deeply. And, you know, he was really part of our family. And I think that helped give him a sense of grounding because he came from a family with just this, a single parent, his mom, he never knew his dad. And I think having a male father figure in the shape of my husband and two brothers, he was an only child. I think it really gave him a sense of stability, which allowed him to focus more on just boxing. He didn't have that much of a void in his life as he did have prior to that. I think he was searching when, when I met him, he was looking, looking for something, you know, he wasn't totally happy. And I like to think that when we got together and he blended into our family, I think it gave him, you know, much needed peace. Do you feel with that focus and with that, that love almost, do you feel that gave him the purpose to go on and achieve what he did do you feel he would have achieved what he had if you'd never crossed paths you know that's so hard to say he's so talented um you know he's one of those fighters that is the complete package you know he could punch he could box his defense was epic that shoulder roll and picking off the the he, he, he was just the total package in my opinion and it shocked me that no one else in town including emmanuel stewart and some of the other people didn't see what I saw, but I never doubted it. You know, it was like, okay, maybe they don't see it, but I see it. And to me, I saw greatness and I took a chance on him. He took a chance on me. And I think it was just fortuitous that we came together because maybe he mm -hmm. needed what I had to offer. And I think I needed that kind of talent to properly establish myself in the business that I wasn't just you know, an overnight fluke or that I didn't manage opponents, you know, or, or people with no talent, but it's really hard to have a world champion, much less, you know, all the ones that I've worked with. 
but I think he put me on the map and I hope I certainly contributed to his success. Talking about that bond, you let him into your house, your home. You like you say, you took him away on holidays. He lived with you for a period of time. Mm-hmm. He almost repaid that by putting the star of David on his shorts. Uh, mm-hmm. How much did that mean to you? It meant everything to me. Um, Tommy Hearns had done that before. Um, and when Tommy did it, I've worked with Tommy for 44 years now. We're still, you know, extremely close friends and we still work together actually. And when he first did it, I was so touched by it. And I think that James saw that in one of the films and of Tommy's early fights and decided to do it. And then the other boxers in my stable, Bronco McCart and the other guys also started doing it. And it was such a tribute. And I think any kind of faith, whether it's the Jewish star or cross, whatever, it just shows that extra dimension of of hope, belief, faith, whatever you want, and that can hurt. Definitely. We mentioned, obviously, James's talent, you know, at the time, around about 1991, he was pound for pound, the number one unbelievable yeah. fighter. But talk to me about outside the ring, first of all. What was he like as a person, first and foremost? Well, I mean, James was was challenging because, you know, like all young guys, or, or at least not everyone, but certainly a great number of young guys, they're temperamental, you know, they have mood swings and James certainly did have mood swings and, you know, he was hard on himself. So if he was overweight, had weight to lose, he would, you know, definitely feel that and express that he'd be short tempered and really more mad at himself than anyone else, but it manifested him, you know, itself in his shortness and so on. But you get used to somebody's behavior when you're with them all the time. And I think that it just was something that we came to expect that when it was fight time, the closer to fight time, the more you just kind of let him be, let him get into his own head and focus on his opponent. And then he'd be back to himself right after the fight. Now, what was he like to work with in a professional capacity? Like you mentioned, there, so he worked with a lot of guys, Tommy Hearns, you know, massive name in the sport as well. But what was James like to work with professionally? A dream because he wasn't afraid to fight anyone. I haven't seen too many fighters that have that cavalier and attitude. James was the kind of a fighter that if I said, you're fighting Joe Smith next Friday, he would say, okay, we didn't have the internet back in the early nineties. So we couldn't go to YouTube and see who this person was. So there were certain people, certain men that had libraries of tapes that they had accumulated from TV. So I would hunt them down and say, do you by any chance have a tape of Murky Sosa or any of the fights of Sander Lyon Williams or any of his early opponents? And, and then we would be able to take a look at the guy, see what his style was, get an idea, his height, um, and if he was orthodox or whether he was a southpaw we could get whatever information we could glean that way. Now it's so easy. You just go on the internet and put in any name and pretty much get what you need to know. But too much information isn't good either because I see with a lot of the fighters today that I've worked with that I'm currently working with, they know too much about the opponent. And then it's like, oh, well, he's too tall or he fought so-and-so. I can go to box rec and look at everything. They're more cautious. And it takes them longer to get to a title. James fought anybody, anytime. He fought 10 times one year. And so he was able to win a world title in two and a half years. Um, That's not as easy to do these days. I have a fighter that I've been working with for five years now, and he's 18 and 0. But it took a long time to get to 18 and 0, partly the pandemic, partly an injury. But it was much easier in those days. Talk to me a bit about matching James. Was it difficult to match him before the world titles came? Well, I think the the best part about matching him was early on, I worked with a local promoter here um, who did monthly fights. And he had a wonderful matchmaker and out of Ohio. And he matched all of James' early fights. And he was brilliant. He knew James's abilities. And he always found him somebody that he felt was maybe 60-40 in James' favor. We never wanted to go lower than that 
I didn't feel that beating a bum was going to be a lesson for him or in any way enhance his career or teach him anything. So we always looked for somebody that was almost equal to him, but not a threat to beating him. And then when we started working with Bob Arum and his matchmaker, um, Ron Katz, it became a different ball game because once you stepped up into major promotions and TV fights, you had to really fight somebody. And so it changed. And I had to really research. I had to take chances that I might not have normally taken, but it was the only way to move up that ladder. If you stayed in the lateral position of fighting the same caliber of fighters, we wouldn't have gotten to the position to get the Michael Nunn fight, which was a turning point. And we were like a substitution for Stevie Collins who had fallen out of the fight. So it was an opportunity that presented itself. And I felt we were prepared for it because we had stepped up the competition in a very gradual manner so that he didn't jump from fighting C fighters and maybe B fighters to an A elite fighter. We had kind of inched our way to that. So he had a pretty solid foundation. And by the time he fought for the title, he was ready. You mentioned there Ron Katz. I spoke to Ron a couple of years ago, and he said that he was very, very adamant on getting James on to be on the top-ranked shows, to push him forward for his fights. And you you had all the belief in the world in James when no one else did. Talk to me, That's, how hard was it to get him on these shows? Oh, let me tell you. Back in the day, I have to tell you, I was the only female manager around. I was the only female, period, in the boxing business. So, you know, it was, there was no Me Too movement then. So everything was like the Wild West. People would say, you want your guy on my card? What are you going to do for me? And it was a lot of the old boys club. And, you know, I had to just stay strong and say, look, I have a fighter that I believe is going to be a world champion if he's given the right opportunities. You can be part of that. You can actually build a champion with me if you just believe in me and trust that I know what I'm doing. I've worked with Tommy Hearns and Milton McCrory and Jimmy Paul and, and Dennis Andres and all the fighters at the Kronk gym for 10 years. I've put in my work. I know what I'm doing. Trust me. And Ron Katz did. And I'll always be eternally grateful for his guidance because he gave me the opportunity to bring James to Atlantic City to fight Murky Sosa, who was a pretty feared fighter at the time. He was very awkward and nobody wanted to fight him. And I said, we'll fight him. And we took that fight. We fought Doug DeWitt. We fought guys that other people didn't want to fight at that time. And James kept rising to the occasion. He won every single fight. Mike McCallum, all the body snatcher, you know, fighters that other people thought, wow, you know, why would you take that fight? We took all the fights that were risky because I believed that mentally James wanted it more than the other fighter. He was that hungry and I just had utter belief in him and I just persevered. You know, I, I sat on the phone day after day and bothered people and I wasn't afraid of being a pest because I figured the squeaky wheel is the one that gets oiled. So I, I squeaked, I squeaked a lot and uh, eventually it paid off. Absolutely. Let's fast forward a little bit. 1991, the Michael Nunn fight. James was your first world champion, I believe. Yes. Uh, what Talk to me about that whole event. You know, first of all, like you say, it was a late replacement. So him coming in to take the fight to then get the victory. What was it like to hear that and the new at the end of the fight for James? Well, the whole experience had been, I would say, a little bit uneven because Michael Nunn being the champion stayed at the beautiful hotel had you know a suite had all the, the the hometown followers the media just was all around him we were so outnumbered in Davenport it was all Michael Nunn fans and I had a little entourage of maybe 25 30 family members and and friends guys from the gym that came we all drove in in the caravan Michael Nunn was at a big suite in a hotel there and we were at a little motel they gave us like a conference room for all of the guys and put bunk beds, little cots in there. No one even had their own rooms. It was really, we were definitely the 
the you know opponent and treated that way. Um, I think that actually served as motivation for James because he didn't want to be treated like that ever again. And he knew that if he was the champion, he'd get the sweets and all the hoopla and the opponent would be the one staying in that motel the next time. So I think that was very motivating to him. And I think that was part of what got him going. Plus at the weigh-in, Michael Nunn and him got into a little tuffle, a little bit of a touching each other. And you don't do that to James. You don't touch him. You don't get in his space. And they almost fought there at the weigh-in, but I interceded and said, look, you know, you're not getting paid to fight today. You're getting paid to fight tomorrow. So let's just hold it off, make him pay. That's the best revenge. Make him pay for it in the ring. Don't, don't waste it now. So, you know, we kind of took him away, fed him. And, you know, after he ate, I think he calmed down more because he was hungry. He had to make weight, you know, he had to make 160 and that was hard for him. And uh, at any rate, he got in there and took him a few rounds to really get his rhythm going. He wasn't winning at the beginning as anyone who saw the fight knows. Uh, he was behind, but he sucked it up and he dug deep and he got that knockout in the 11th round. And that feeling of elation and just accomplishment is pretty hard to, to equal because that was my first world champion of my own. I'd worked with so many others as a PR person and you know, as a support team, but not when it was my fighter. So it, it kind of established me in the business that I knew what I was doing, that I wasn't um, a front for someone else, that there wasn't a man behind me that was pulling the strings. Absolutely. You mentioned there, obviously, Michael Nunn, he had the sweet head of the luxuries of a champion. And James took that as motivation, knew that he would get that if he beat Michael Nunn. How was James, when he did start getting the luxuries, did he ever change or was he still the same person? Was he still humble? Well, I think like every young man that comes from, you know, not having a lot to all of a sudden having disposable income that he can buy things with, um, I think that he enjoyed the trappings, you know, of buying fancy jewelry and buying cars and multiple cars because instead of just buying a car you could buy two cars and you could fit them out with the most elaborate sound systems and so I think that he enjoyed what he was accomplishing financially and you know bought himself a nice house bought his mother a house he um he enjoyed it you know, and he was still, I think, very approachable by fans and by friends. You know, he never was rude to fans or, or got an attitude of being better than anyone. And I think coming up under the shadow of Tommy Hearns in Detroit was a really good thing for him because Tommy Hearns is such a gracious man and is so, you know, wonderful to his fans. And he's such a good role model that I think it was great for James to see how Tommy Hearns conducted himself and still does. And it gave him something to aspire to. Definitely. Um, now, when did you and James stop working together? Did you work together for the Roy James Jr. fight? Oh yeah. So, that was that though that was interesting because that was a fight that um everyone wanted. You know, the fans wanted it, the magazines were always saying you know, this would be the fight, the fight that people want to see. And when it finally came together, it was very exciting. The money was really great. Um, everyone was excited for the fight. We had a great training camp, good sparring, a lot of publicity. I mean, obviously it was a big fight at that time, 1994. And uh, I think overall, it was the biggest moment of our career together and actually what happened was the weight loss was a problem you know going into the fight I think he had to lose too much weight too soon you know in too short a time 
and it took its toll on him. You know, I think that he wasn't the James Tony I was used to seeing, and I just think he wasn't able to rise to the occasion that night. You know, his worst night was Roy Jones' best night, and it just ended up that James came up short. But I think that was excruciating for him. He had never tasted defeat before, and he had been touted as one of the best fighters out there. And so to lose was a very foreign concept to him. You know, our motto was losing is not an option. And then here it became reality. So it was a very difficult time very for all of us because I, I believe that he could have beat Roy Jones. I think under different circumstances, he would have, but that's boxing. Sometimes you come short and that night he just came up short. Definitely. Uh, just a last question from me, Jackie. Um, looking back, what's your favorite memory with James, whether it be in the ring, outside the ring or whatever? Obviously him winning the first title was just a glorious moment for both of us. Um, as I said, it was career making for me in terms of other fighters seeking me out and saying, can you do for me what you did for him? So it kind of gave me a, a lot of credibility. Um, but some of the moments that I cherished the most were the things out of the ring, planning his first wedding with him and seeing the excitement of him giving birth to his first child, going with him and his wife to the ultrasounds and seeing the little images of the baby that was yet to be born and watching him buy his first house and seeing him decorate it and make a home for himself. Watching him become the fighter of the year in 1991 and knowing that I had contributed to that, that I had believed in him and, and it paid off. And we had that to always hold us together that he knows that someone believed in him enough to, to get him all the way to the biggest thing you could get, and that's the world championship. So I think there was a bond there that still exists. I had lunch with James a few months back in LA, and there's still that, that closeness there. We share memories that a lot of people will never share. And I think that that will always be there. You know, we have that special bond. And it's like a mother's son, but it's a little bit more than that because it was a business relationship as well. But, you know, I think the world of him. For, for yourself, and you can see how you feel about James. You can see that you're proud of his achievements and his accomplishments. Do you feel pride in knowing that you were a catalyst for his achievements? Absolutely. It's one of the, the best things I've done in my life is taking this young, raw talent and believing in him enough to make him believe in himself and to be able to convince the boxing world that this is a valuable fighter. This is somebody that is capable of becoming a world champion if you believe in him the way I do. I just feel that that accomplishment will, will just always stand and James and I will always have that legacy together. Absolutely. Jackie, I want to thank you very much for your time. I really appreciate you sharing your stories with me.